Did you hear that actor Bruce Willis lost $5.8 million in arbitration a couple of months ago? Wow, that's hard to swallow. Can you help me? Can you tell me? I mean, what the, what the hell is going on here? Check. If you're heading to arbitration, you don't want to lose millions like Bruce Willis. That's why in today's video, I give you five easy steps to follow so that you can win the arbitration process. And stick around to the end of today's video where I will give you four bonus strategies to help you get the advantage in the arbitration process. Hi, I'm attorney Ian Corzine, and I've been practicing for 20 years. And in my years of practice, I've seen so many people taken advantage of because they don't know the law. Well, we have to stop that. Join me in my mission to help people understand the law and make it work for them. This channel is all about helping people and getting to the heart of the matter. In recent years, the arbitration process has become more popular for resolving civil disputes. From employment contracts to leases to health plans, even car rental agreements contain arbitration clauses in them. So that means if you get in a civil dispute, let's say with your landlord, you're gonna have to undergo arbitration sooner or later. I don't want you to lose millions like Bruce Willis did. That's why I'm giving you five easy steps to follow to win the arbitration process and be sure to stick around to the end of the video where I'm gonna give you four bonus tips, bonus strategies to help you get the advantage in the arbitration process. But before we get there, we're gonna to have to define some terms. And the first term I wanna talk about is civil dispute. Basically a civil dispute is an argument you have with another about money. Most civil disputes are resolved in court, but sometimes they're resolved in arbitration. That brings us to the definition of arbitration. What is arbitration? That is an extra court proceeding that you and another party agree to to handle a civil dispute that arises out of usually a contract. Usually in arbitration, the parties hire a retired judge or a lawyer to review evidence that they present and make a decision. They do this in an effort to hopefully save costs and save time because court proceedings can take a long time. Turning back to Bruce Willis, he was set to star in a movie called Wake in 2016. This is a movie where he was the lead character and he played this guy who was a sociopath who went back to visit his estranged family in a remote island. The movie producer promised to pay Bruce Willis $8 million regardless of whether or not the movie went forward or not. And he paid him $3 million. However, as the movie started to film, they had financial difficulties and they defaulted on their payment to Bruce Willis. In other words, they only paid him 3 million, not the full 8 million. Bruce Willis wanted his full 8 million bucks. So pursuant to the contract he entered into with the movie producer, he started an arbitration in California to be able to recover the $5 million that he wasn't paid. But whoops, he forgot one thing. And that was he forgot to join to the action, the producer himself in what lawyers call his individual capacity. And as a result, he asked the arbitrator to add him later on in the proceedings to be an individual who could be liable for that $5 million. But no, 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 you can't do that. In California, non-signatories to an arbitration agreement, in other words, people who don't sign the agreement cannot be bound by its provisions without a judge making a decision on that. In Bruce Willis's case, Bruce Willis asked the arbitrator to make that decision. The arbitrator went with them and said, yes, we're gonna join the movie producer to this arbitration. However, that was wrong under California law. Only judges can do that. So on appeal, the court of appeal effectively reversed the judgment against the movie producer so that Bruce Willis would lose millions. I don't want this to happen to you. So let's go over the five easy steps to winning at arbitration. Step number one, read the rules. I know it sounds obvious, but the bottom line is if you're involved in an arbitration, you need to know the rules so that you can win. Uh, the arbitration rules are usually in the arbitration agreement itself. Sometimes they're incorporated by reference. Regardless, find the rules, read them, so that you know the provisions and how they function. I think that if Bruce Willis and his attorneys had known the rules better, they probably wouldn't have lost on appeal and lost millions of dollars. Step number two, pick the place of arbitration. Now, oftentimes the arbitration agreement has a clause in it which says where the arbitration should take place, 
but you as a party to an arbitration need to request in writing where you want the arbitration to take place. If you don't do that, then oftentimes you waive that opportunity and the other side can control where the arbitration is. One of the main reasons to do arbitration is to save money and to save time. And if you have to travel a long distance, you're not gonna save money, you're not gonna save time, and the chances are you're gonna have a difficult time prevailing in the arbitration. Okay guys, it's time to take a breath. I know it's been a lot of detail coming at you in a short period of time. So I'm gonna take a little LaCroix break. I'm not sponsored by them, but I drink probably five LaCroix a day and my favorite of course is coconut. Thanks for the advice. Okay guys, now we're ready for step number three, which is research the arbitrator. I have to tell you guys, I've made some mistakes in my career where I've failed to do the adequate research I needed to do to uncover the bias that particular triers of fact, like an arbitrator, have on my particular case. It is so important to research the arbitrator. How do you do it? Well, this is gonna sound funny, and I've done some research on how to research arbitrators, uh, but the best method is actually to go on Google and Google the arbitrator. You're gonna find uh, the history of the arbitrator, where he or she worked, uh, perhaps some decisions that the arbitrator made. Uh, these are gonna uncover kind of a full picture of the person, which you want, because let's face it, we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but the bottom line is people make up decisions. They make up their mind on cases really in really short periods of time. And so if you can uncover biases about a particular arbitrator, then you're better served at winning the arbitration. The second kind of step to doing an, a research for arbitrator would be to look at his or her published awards. It's useful, but it's not the best thing in the world because the bottom line is the arbitrator probably published those opinions because they're his or her best. So they're maybe not representative of all the decisions of the arbitrator. And the third thing you can do, of course, is go to a rating service and pay some money to do a rating of the arbitrator. Now, this is kind of effective. I mean, if you really need to find huge biases, like if the arbitrator rules for defendant 80% of the time, then yeah, that's important for you to know. But little subtleties in your case, they really don't do that good a job. So you're gonna laugh, but probably the best way to find out about your chosen arbitrator is to Google the arbitrator. That's one thing that Bruce Willis did well. He must have done some good research on the arbitrator because he won in the decision to join the movie producer to the arbitration, and then he won again the judgment of $5.8 million. Step number four, use the discovery process. You know, sometimes in arbitration there is no discovery process, but oftentimes agreements provide for discovery. What is discovery? Well, that's sort of the investigation process for a civil dispute. Parties can send over written questions to each other and have them answer under oath. A uh, party could send out subpoenas, serve subpoenas on third parties to be able to get documents to be able to use in the arbitration. Sometimes what we'll do is depose people. We'll go through depositions, one or two or three, depends on the particular case. But the bottom line is we'll, we'll get some evidence together so that we can use that in the arbitration. Why is that really important? Well, if we just submit on the papers, then the arbitrator has no opportunity to see outside evidence that might convince him that your client deserves to win. Let's face it, arbitrators are people too. And as people, we oftentimes make up our mind on a particular case within the first one or two minutes of hearing the facts. We just kind of judge it that way. So I learned a long ago that if you, know, you think that the arbitrator is not going your way, the only way you can win is to go on cross-examination. And if you have cross-examination, you need evidence to support it. And cross-examination basically is, is a design to be able to implicate someone in a lie. If you can implicate someone in a lie, the case will go your way. It, it's amazing shift. You see it in TV a lot of times where they'll have a cross examination scene and someone will, you know, the, the lawyer will, will show that this person is not telling the truth and the whole case changes. Well, that is something that is true in real life. If you can show that the basis for the other side's case is a lie, boom, you win. Here we go on to rule number five, and that is never waive an arbitration hearing. You know, sometimes it's very tempting when you're going forward in an arbitration, when there's a lot of documents that support your side, and basically what you wanna do is just submit those documents and have the arbitrator come to a decision because you believe you're in the right and you should win. 
people, never, never just submit on the documents. Always do a presentation. You never, you wanna give the opportunity to the arbitrator to decide in your favor. And you know what? It really is compelling when someone is standing before you and giving you the facts of the case as they see them. It is really compelling when there's a cross-examination. It's an active cross-examination before the arbitrator. Like I said before, oftentimes arbitrators kind of make up the decision right when they first hear the opening statement. So the only opportunity you have if the arbitrator is not going your way is to cross-examine and you could only cross-examine in the hearing itself. So never waive your arbitration hearing. Always go through the process. I know it's difficult, I know it's taxing, I know it's costly, but it's really, really in your best interest. Remember though, just because you're gonna go through a hearing, it doesn't mean you're gonna win. Bruce Willis went through the arbitration hearing and he even had a trial court affirm the award of the arbitrator, but he lost on appeal. So what that shows is, you need to make sure that you're following the rules so that the Court of Appeal doesn't come back later on and say, hey, you didn't follow this rule, and so as a result, you lose. We don't wanna do that. All right, guys, now it's time for my four bonus strategies to give you the advantage in the arbitration process. The first one is summary judgment. If you haven't heard of this, it's a procedure usually in a civil dispute in which one party makes a motion and says, it's undisputed that I deserve to win or the other side deserves to lose this case. Well, you can still do that even in an arbitration. So long as the arbitration rules provide for it or the parties agree, you should make a motion for summary judgment. What's really great about motions for summary judgment, and I've always liked them since I was a, a law clerk for a federal judge, is that they cut out certain portions of the case so that you can actually truncate, you can make smaller the arbitration uh, process and be able to save money and time. So I would always advocate that if there's a particular issue that you can cut out of the case early on for an arbitration, make a motion for summary judgment. The second bonus strategy I have for you for the arbitration process is bifurcation of issues. Sometimes it makes sense for you to make a motion to bifurcate the proceedings. You know, uh, oftentimes in a civil dispute, there's a liability portion and a damages portion. And if you go through the liability portion and you're found liable, well, boy, maybe the damages are more certain and maybe you can shorten the process by just going through arbitration of a particular issue. Sometimes uh, maybe you don't have a defense to liability. Yes, you crashed into the person, but there is an issue concerning damages. Well, why don't you just have an arbitration on damages to decide those damages? And that way you can shorten the arbitration process and also save some time and save some money. My third bonus strategy for winning an arbitration is putting together a list of undisputed facts. You know, most cases, 75% of the facts are undisputed. There was a contract. It was signed by the opposing party. It was signed by my client. It said this. Well, you can agree with the other side that those facts are undisputed and that way you can save time in the arbitration by not disputing, not putting evidence on concerning those particular facts. So one way to really truncate the proceedings is to have a, a list of undisputed facts that you agree with the other side, and then you just try before the arbitrator the issues that are material and disputed. The final technique that I have for getting the advantage in the arbitration process is high-low. You know, sometimes both sides don't know how strong their case is. And one way to resolve that, what's so great about arbitration is that you can agree to different procedures. One way is the high-low. And that is, let's say plaintiff thinks he's gonna get some damages, but he doesn't know how much, but he thinks that he wants a million dollars. And let's say the defense, they're not so sure about their case either. They may have to pay some, but they don't think they have to pay a million dollars. Well, what you can do is you can tell the arbitrator, listen, I want you to make a decision on who wins, plaintiff or defendant. And if defendant wins, then defendant pays plaintiff 100,000. And if plaintiff wins, then defendant pays plaintiff a million. So the bottom line is you kind of hedge your bets. The plaintiff is guaranteed something. And the defense is you know, working so hard to pay little, but at the same time, they don't have to worry about a million dollar judgment if the ruling is in their favor. So a high-low often works in arbitration. You really can't do it in, in court disputes but it's a great way to hedge your bets to be able to just go in and have the arbitrator make one decision about who wins, who loses, and then you have set amounts for whoever wins or loses. Now we've discussed the five easy steps to winning in the arbitration process. We've also discussed those four bonus strategies to get the advantage in the arbitration process. 
But do you have any questions about arbitration in general? If so, please put it in the comments below. I wanna hear from you about your questions on the arbitration process, how to win, what not to do. Any questions you have on arbitration, I wanna hear, so please put them in the comment section. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and also subscribe to our channel, join us. Join us in our effort to have people understand the law and make it work for them. You can do that by subscribing and hitting the bell button that's right next to the subscription button. And that way you'll be notified every Wednesday when a new Heart of the Matter video comes out. A couple more things. Join us on our Heart of the Matter Facebook group. This is an area, a forum, where we talk about what we talk about in our YouTube videos in more detail. And I answer questions from various people on Facebook about the particular subject. So maybe it's a homeowner's insurance policy, or maybe it's a employer's liability policy, or perhaps it's arbitration. So join us on our Facebook group. One last thing, on Instagram TV, we're doing a series called Business From The Heart. This is a, a video where we'll discuss various different networking and marketing strategies for lawyers and other business people. I happen to believe that 50% of your effort should be on face-to-face -face networking, and then 50% of your effort should be on social media. It needs to be balanced, and we'll discuss the areas where face-to-face -face communication is important and how you get tips and strategies to be able to maximize your face-to-face -face business communications. All right, that's enough for today. See you next time. Thanks for the advice.